Wednesday, April 30th, 1980. Six heavily armed gunmen storm an Iranian embassy in London, taking dozens of staff members and visitors hostage while demanding the release of Kazakhstani prisoners in Iran. The crisis quickly turned into a six-day siege that gripped the nation. And its sudden conclusion interrupted TV coverage worldwide as more than 30 masked SAS operators stormed the embassy on live TV, saving the hostages in 17 minutes' time. In 1979, in wake of the Iranian Revolution, a nationwide uprising erupts in Kazakhstan as thousands of Arabs long oppressed by the Shah of Iran revolt against Iranian security forces to seek their autonomy. But the insurgents were quickly shut down by Iranian security forces, and hundreds of lives were lost on both sides. And this swift crackdown only provoked the initiation of several splinter groups of Arab separatists, such as the Democratic Revolutionary Front for the Liberation of Arbistan, Who's their fucking leader, Zoolander? The DRFLA devised a plan following the playbook of the Iran hostage crisis. Stick up an embassy, hold up some hostages, and state your business. And by March 31st of 1980, using Iraqi passports, three members of the DRFLA arrived in London to do just that. They rented a flat, and slowly but surely, their numbers began to multiply, even housing over a dozen DRFLA members inside the flat. And speaking of numbers, shameless plug, I really wanna start sharing my photography with you guys. And I recommend you guys follow my Instagram account. Or if you wanna stay up to date on my upcoming feature film, hint, hint, uh, you can do all that on Instagram. Sorry, back to the video. <clears throat> By April 30th, the DRFLA broke the lease of their flat and rendezvoused with a Soviet arms dealer, acquiring hand grenade submachine guns and a shit ton of ammo. The heavily armed six-man team arrived outside the Iranian embassy in London. And 15 minutes later, the team stormed the building, firing their weapons into the air, and immediately overpowered police constable Trevor Locke. Moments after, he pushed the emergency button on his radio, transmitting a distress signal to the authorities. The leader of the group, Owan Ali Mohammed, rounded up the hostages, consisting predominantly of Iranian nationals, British embassy employees, BBC journalists, and visitors touring among the gardens. The 26 hostages were briefed by Mohammed that they will soon die unless the Iranian government listens to his demands to release Kazakhstani prisoners. London Metro Police arrived on scene in minutes and secured a perimeter around the embassy. Officers attempted to approach the building but retreated after a gunman appeared through the window at high ready. Media caught wind of the situation and soon journalists from all over the country flocked to 19 Princess Gate. In response to the ongoing crisis, ministers of the British government, civil servants, and expert advisors, including military and law enforcement representatives, assembled and discussed a resolution. The meeting was chaired by William Whitelaw, the Home Secretary, as Margaret Thatcher, the Prime Minister at the time, was unavailable. And right away, politics began muddling immediate action. The Iranian government accused the British and American governments of sponsoring the attack as a response of an ongoing siege at a U.S. embassy in Tehran. And Thatcher, receiving updates from white law, determined that British law would be applied to the embassy. Inside the embassy, Mohammed issues his demands to negotiate. And if Iran so fails to release the prisoners, the embassy would be blown up by noon the following day. But despite these threats, day one of the siege ended with some hope as he released his first hostage, a pregnant female. By day two, committee meetings continued, and for the first time, direct action was put on the table. And members of the elite special air service training near Hereford were briefed on the situation. Special operators of the 22nd SAS, a tier one unit, responded and staged at a holding facility at Regent's Park's barracks and began planning a potential op. Meanwhile, back at the embassy, Mohammed orders a BBC hostage to phone his news desk. Mohammed jumps on the line and informs British media that non-Iranian hostages would not be harmed. And to further prove it, another non-Iranian hostage was released by Mohammed. And so far, he was a man of his word, leading authorities to ponder what would come by noon. But by the time noon came, there was no detonation and his bluff had failed. And Mohammed began to backtrack, requesting safe passage out of the UK without arrest aborting his original plans. By day three, Mohammed requested ambassadors of Arab nations assist him in his negotiation to flee the UK with safe passage. 
Meanwhile, the SAS obtained intel from the embassy caretaker, who briefed the teams on the nomenclature, positions, and weaknesses of the reinforced security doors and armored windows. Mock-ups were designed, and contingencies and scenarios were put to the test. And in addition to direct action, the SAS studied and memorized the faces of each gunman by using copies of their passports. The SAS snuck onto the roof of the embassy and began planting gear, unlocking skylights, and attaching ropes to chimneys and various access ports to increase their points of entrance, should others fail. And by day six, three more non-Iranian hostages are released, but the tensions continue to rise within the embassy, and Mohammed begins to lose his mind. He phoned negotiators making crazy demands that he would kill his first hostage in 45 minutes unless they got him on the line with an Arab ambassador. Abbas Lavasani, the embassy's chief press officer, was shot and killed by Muhammad. His body was placed outside the embassy's doors as proof, and Thatcher authorized the British army to take over and make an example of what happens to people who try to fuck around in England. The operators broke off into two teams. Red team was tasked with storming the second, third, and fourth floor from the roof, while blue team was tasked with storming the ground floors from the garden and working their way up. And both teams set out to breach simultaneously, to hit the gunmen with speed, surprise, and violence of action. And at 7.23 p.m., the team arrived, and journalists, news reporters, and news anchors were stunned to witness masked men wielding MP5s virtually take over the embassy on live TV. Red Team immediately found themselves facing problems. Warrant Officer Thomas Goodyear became stuck while abseiling from the roof. Red Team operators failing to synchronize their breach with Blue Team desperately smash in the windows and deploy stun grenades and CS gas into the building. But the CS gas ignites a window curtain, lighting the gas mask of Sergeant Tommy Palmer on fire. Palmer rips off his mask and continues to push forward through the CS gas leading his team into the building, with or without his PPE. Palmer exits the room and spots a gunman pouring kerosene on the floor. He squeezes the trigger of his MP5, but it fails to discharge. The gunman spots Palmer and runs towards a conference room with a hand grenade, but Palmer quickly transitions to his sidearm and kills the gunman with a single shot. Within the conference room, three gunmen begin indiscriminately shooting into the hostages, just as the SAS breached the room. The gunmen kill one hostage and wound several others. And as the SAS moves in, the gunmen seize fire and hide among the hostages. One attempts to throw a grenade, but is immediately shot by the SAS. And another attempts to detonate a grenade, but meets the same fate on behalf of the SAS. The operators clear out the conference room, not knowing that a third gunman is still hiding among the hostages. Meanwhile, blue team breaches the first floor, taking out reinforced windows with explosives. And as they move on, they discover Muhammad holding a pistol to the head of PC Trevor Locke, as Muhammad got the better of him after Trevor Locke tackled Muhammad at the beginning of the SAS operation. One operator shoves PC Trevor Locke, knocking both Muhammad and Trevor Locke backwards. As Muhammad stumbles and becomes inches separated from PC Trevor Locke, another SAS operator smokes him with a burst of his MP5. Red team and blue team begin clearing the building and evacuating hostages. And while evacuating hostages down a stairwell, one SAS operator immediately recognized the hidden gunman within the group of hostages, whom he remembered from his passport photo. He struck the man over the head with his MP5. The gunman reached for a grenade, and two more SAS operators shot him as he was still falling to the ground. The remaining hostages are escorted into the garden, where they await to be identified and triaged for injuries. One of six gunmen survive and makes it into the garden hiding among the hostages, but the SAS spot him and take him into custody. After 17 minutes, all but one of the hostages are rescued. The crime scene is turned over to police, and before the SAS return to Hereford, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher arrives on the scene to personally thank the men for their successful mission. PC Trevor Locke was considered a hero for his actions. He was awarded the George Medal, the United Kingdom's second highest civil honor. Warrant Officer First Class Tommy Goodyear was awarded the Queen's Gallantry Medal for his part in the assault. The gunman captured alive by the SAS was sentenced to life in prison 
and has since been released on parole as of 2008. The SAS showcased to the world that there are certain levels to the game, and law enforcement agencies and military units worldwide reimagined what's possible. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And like I said, if you want to stay up to date on my upcoming film, be sure to follow me over on Instagram. It's still kind of top secret, but uh, you can put the pieces together over there. Anyways, I'm going to plug back into writing. I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.